Mass spectrometry and infrared spectroscopy give us some important information about a compound. Its molecular weight, chemical formula, degrees of unsaturation, and the presence or absence of double bonds, triple bonds, and hydrogen-containing functional groups. But even with all that information, it's usually pretty challenging to deduce a precise chemical structure. Consider these spectra. We can tell that the compound contains a bromine, and from the high resolution mass spectrum determined that it has the formula C4H9Br and so zero degrees of unsaturation. The infrared spectrum isn't very useful. We only see CH bonds. Is it one bromobutane or two bromobutane? T-butyl bromide or isobutyl bromide? Nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR spectroscopy helps us to answer this question by providing information about the symmetry and connectivity of the molecule. Before we see what the actual spectra look like, let's delve into the theory briefly. Do you remember that electrons possess the property known as spin? We often describe electrons as little spinning charges that can spin either clockwise or counterclockwise. Well, it turns out that protons and neutrons, the components of atomic nuclei, also possess this property. In most atoms, the spins of all the protons and neutrons in the nuclei cancel out, much like electrons spin pair. However, some nuclei, especially those with odd numbers of protons and neutrons, have net spin that isn't zero. These nuclei are special, and they're called NMR active nuclei because they can absorb particular frequencies of radiation that give us information about where those nuclei are in relation to one another in a molecule. Imagine a tiny, tiny spinning nucleus, a positively charged mass. Under normal circumstances, that nucleus probably doesn't care whether it's spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. Those two states have identical energies. We chemists use the word degenerate to describe things that have the same energy. So under most circumstances, the possible spin states of the nucleus are degenerate. But those two little spinning charges are creating magnetic fields of their own. And if we apply a magnetic field, which has directionality, then the nuclei whose spins align with the applied magnetic field are lower in energy than those whose spins align against the magnetic field that we've applied. This creates a difference in energy between two possible states for the nucleus. And when we have two states with an energy difference, then photons that match that energy, di energy difference can be absorbed. Essentially, the absorption of appropriate photon energies causes nuclei to switch their spin state. It so happens that this energy difference is really, really quite tiny. So radio frequency photons are the ones typically involved. The precise magnitude of this energy difference is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field at the nucleus. Stronger magnetic field, bigger difference, absorbs higher frequency photons. A weaker magnetic field means a, a smaller difference, means absorbs lower frequency photons. So if we put a sample of a molecule into a magnetic field, which has a constant strength, you'd probably expect that all of its spinning nuclei would absorb the same energy. This wouldn't be very useful for determining molecular structure. Lucky for us, Nuclei at different locations within a molecule experience different net magnetic field strengths based on their electronic environment. To understand this, recall that electrons are themselves little charged particles, and when charged particles are placed in a magnetic field, they begin to oscillate or move in tiny, tiny little circles within the orbitals they reside in. And charges that are oscillating generate their own magnetic fields. 
These induced magnetic fields act as little modifiers to the big magnetic field that we've applied. So, depending on the particular electronic environment around a specific nucleus, it may experience a slightly larger or slightly smaller magnetic field than average, and therefore will absorb a slightly higher or lower frequency of photon. This allows us to observe different absorption frequencies for different electronic environments within a particular molecule. So a nucleus that's near three fluorine atoms, which pull electron density away by their electronegativity, will absorb different photons than a nucleus farther from those fluorines. Even the most subtle of differences in electronic environment can have an effect. This is the basis of NMR spectroscopy, that nuclei in different environments within a molecule absorb photons of different frequencies based on the number of different absorptions and their relative energies, we can deduce some important information about the structure of a molecule.